Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Fracknoy. I'm the astronomy instructor here at Foothill College in Los Altos Hills, California. And it's a great pleasure for me to welcome everyone here in the Smithwick Auditorium and everyone watching us on the web to this first talk in the 17th annual Silicon Valley Astronomy Lecture Series. For uh, more than 16 years now, we've been bringing uh, well-known astronomers and great new ideas in astronomy uh, to our uh, viewing audience here in the college and then everyone beyond watching on the web. Uh, we're delighted uh, that we're going to continue to have the sponsorship of the four organizations that make this possible. The uh, NASA Ames Research Center, the Foothill College Astronomy Program, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, and the SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute, all of them doing excellent work in science and education. So let me now introduce tonight's speaker and very special topic. He has been here before. He's one of our favorite speakers, Dr. Seth Shostak. Uh, Dr. Seth Shostak is the senior astronomer at the SETI Institute and holds degrees from Princeton University and the California Institute of Technology. In addition to his professional publications in astronomy and astrobiology, he has penned over 500 popular articles on astronomy, technology, film, and television. He has chaired the International Academy of Aeronautics Permanent Study Group on SETI, and he's been the chair for a decade. And each week, he hosts the SETI Institute's hour-long science radio show called Big Picture Science, which you can hear on many public radio stations around the country and also on the web. Just Google Big Picture Science. Uh, Dr. Shostak has written and edited and contributed to a half a dozen books, including a wonderful textbook on astrobiology and the popular book, Confessions of an Alien Hunter, A Scientist Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And really, that's, I think, what has made uh, Dr. Shostak's reputation, is that he has been the face and the voice of the search for life elsewhere in the universe. He is able, in his unique way, to translate the scientific ideas that lie behind the search into everyday language and make it accessible to us all. And that's what he's going to do with tonight's really fun topic, the science of Star Wars. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege for me to present to you Dr. Seth Shostak. I was just talking to uh, the chairman of the board of the SETI Institute, Dan Langford, down here about how, as a speaker, you never want a florid introduction because the audience will only be disappointed. Uh, I have to say that this topic, I first want to thank Andy for you know, inviting me to give this talk and also telling me what the subject was going to be. Uh, <laughs> but you did. But, but in half of the emails he sent me, it was the science of Star Trek, which I actually know something about, but in the end it turned out not to be that. Anyhow, for his kind hospitality and, <laughs> well, you know, that's, that's a faux pas that no speaker should ever make which is to say at the beginning of your talk, actually, I don't know anything about this, right? <laughs> but, but that's true. I mean, I'm not really a Star Wars fan. I love sci-fi, and in particular, I love cinema sci-fi. Uh, for example, this film, I think many of you are probably familiar with the mole people. Uh, it was sort of a subterranean spectacular. And you can dig it, this, this film, you can, but th this film, as bad as it was, actually wasn't quite as bad as the sequel, Return of the Mole People. <laughs> I've, I've also uh, advised on a half a dozen films, so I'll get back to that. But I'm not a Star Wars devotee. I've not seen most of the films, and the ones that I have seen, I don't remember. So uh, if you really want a, a true Star Wars take on the science, maybe you ought to buy this book. I notice, uh, you know, I'm not related to the author, I've, I've actually, you know, bought the book and it now decorates my bookshelves, but I've not actually cracked it, but it's, 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 only, it's only $8 on Amazon, so there you go. All right, now the first thing I tried to do when I was thinking about this subject was to get a handle on the storyline, right? And that's not easy with Star Wars. I mean, for, for the kind of films that I like, it is easy because I can't follow difficult ones. Uh, this is War of the Worlds, the remake, 
my apologies to the Chris Christie reference, but if you don't get it, it's okay. <laughs> now, the, the, the plot summary of this film is very straightforward, right? You know, Martians keen to have our water come to Earth and begin an expensive project to destroy our cities and eradicate the inhabitants. Uh, terrestrial bacteria make them sick and they die. Roll end credits. That's it, right? That you can understand. Now, let me read you one tiny segment, I think this is about 5% of what was written here, of the plot description of Star Wars, this franchise, written by Gersh Kunzman of the New York Daily News. <clears throat> Anakin is assigned to protect Republic loyalists, Senator Padme Amidala, and they fall in love. Meanwhile, Obi-Wan discovers that a Jedi master has ordered the creation of an army of clones based on a single bounty hunter, Jango Fett, whom Obi-Wan determines is the assassin trying to kill Padme, though he does not know why. He also has no idea why the Jedi have ordered up a clone army. He, <laughs> meanwhile, Anakin's mom is murdered, and he freaks out, channeling the dark side of their... I won't go on. It goes on. But who can parse that storyline? I mean, who can? It's harder to follow than a Bulgarian poet. So I'm going to try and cheat a little bit here and just ruminate about some of the present, uh, premises and appurtenances of Star Wars. Does it represent anything like our own future, which apparently would be our past because this takes place in a galaxy far, far away and long, long ago. So this is a personal reaction, not just to Star Wars, uh, and certainly not specifically to the last episode, which I believe is The Force Awakens. I saw that. The Force was awake. <laughs> I'm not sure that I was. Anyhow, <laughs> the, the Force Awakens. That sounds to me like an early episode of Hill Street Blues or something like that. I'm sure that many of you are much more qualified to make these analyses than I am, and you will think that too. But I will speak to the general subject of cinema sci-fi. Uh, and if by accident, I inadvertently say something funny, please be assured that's not my intention and it probably won't happen anyhow. Okay, as I say, despite my lack of passion for Star Wars, I do like cinema sci-fi. Now, here's Star Wars. Here's cinema. This is classic cinema sci-fi. Some of you may recognize this. This was the original version of War of the Worlds and these things that look like they're based on uh, gooseneck uh, floor lamps are actually Martian machines and they're headed for LA where they're going to trash the city. This sequence played very well here in Northern California. But that's, and, and the story of, so, you know, I, I do like, you know, classic cinema, but classic cinema is not Star Wars. Star Wars is not classic cinema sci-fi, right? Because uh, it doesn't fit neatly into the two categories, the two themes of cinema sci-fi that were pointed out in a book long ago by a guy by the name of John Baxter. Brilliant book, actually. He says there are really only two themes in cinema sci-fi, and one is, loss of identity. Daddy is not daddy anymore, right? Okay, now that speaks to some sort of primal fear that we all have that, you know, we wake up one morning and our parents are not our parents anymore. I mean, they look like our parents, but something has happened, right? So films like uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, this one, or I Married a Monster from Outer Space. I've had several women claim that that was their, their situation, but <laughs> There was actually a movie. Um, okay, so that's, that's theme one, but that's not Star Wars. It's not that they've lost their identity. The second theme was, there are some things man was not meant to know. All right, now, you know, this is <laughs> the hubris, the threat of knowledge. It's very non-science, by the way, because if you were to grab a scientist and say, you know, you'll never answer that question because there are some things mankind was never meant to know, they would say, get out of here, I just wrote a proposal to the NSF to do that. So, <laughs> so that, that, that's the whole creature feature cycle, alien, colossus, the Forbin project, all of that. And more to the point, in classic sci-fi, I point this out to you because it's something to keep in mind. Uh, British novelist Kingsley Amos made this remark years ago. The hero is the idea. The heroes are the idea, not Luke Skywalker, not Princess Leia, or Obi-Wan Kenobi, if that's really his name. It's that, or in this case, Michael Rennie right there. Remember at the end of the film, he, he warns humans to behave, otherwise they're going to get punished. This is a Cold War kind of thing, right? And he stands there in front of the camera and uh, talks to the camera for three minutes about what you people do with your own planet is of no concern to us, but when you, that kind of thing. But Michael Rennie is such an interesting guy, such a great actor and with a great voice that he could have read the Brooklyn phone book to you and you still would have sat there. 
Now, I have to say, I was, and this will come back up later, I was a, uh, the science advisor, advisor for the remake of this film, Day the Earth Stood Still 2, if you will, and it didn't have this scene in it. And I, I remember going up to the director, Scott Derrickson, at some point during the filming, and I said, you know, Scott, the most impressive part of that film was this soliloquy at the end by Michael Rennie, and then Bernard Herrmann's music comes up and everybody starts sweating and then walks out of the theater. And he looked up at me and he said, Seth, today's audiences are not going to sit there for three minutes while some guy talks to them. So I figure you've probably had enough already, right? You're going <laughs> to file out. <laughs> okay, anyhow. Now, in most talks or essays on the science of fill in your favorite movie, the usual thing is to examine how accurate, plausible, or otherwise acceptable is the science and the technology in the film. Now, I'm not one to eschew the obvious, so I will do some of this. I mean, you know, who could resist the schadenfreude of nitpicking the technical faux pas of a $200 million movie that grosses more in a day than most people in this audience are going to make in their entire lifetime? Here it is, Star Wars. And by the way, I want to compare the cost of the Star Wars franchise to another project of the last, well, the 19th century, actually, the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, th that cost $50 million, but that was in 1869 dollars. Today, that would be, what would it be? I got it here. Uh, $900 million, right? More or less what Donald Trump lost in 20 years ago. <laughs> okay, so. That's what that would cost, you know, in today's dollars. Well, all I can say is that's half the cost of the Star Wars franchise, right? So just to give you an idea. Okay, now, before I go into some of the things that are just wrong, funky, or just goofy, uh, I want to point out some things that are plausible, that could be said to be right, okay? For example, Tatooine, or that's the planet in the outer rim, whatever, whatever that is. I think it's something on my car. The outer rim that orbits a double star. Now, you can see them there, Tattoo one and Tattoo 2. No one's ever accused astronomers of being ingenious in their naming. So there they are, and the big advantage is that it makes for a great visual, but beyond that, Luke Skywalker can, you know, ride into the sun sets. Now, you know, when this film came out, most people didn't realize that there really are a lot of double stars out there. In fact, more than half of all stars are double stars, and in fact, some of them have planets. In 2011, uh, an astronomy team led by Lawrence Doyle of the SETI Institute uh, used NASA's Kepler Space Telescope to discover a planet orbiting two stars. In fact, here it is, if I can find it here. Yes, Kepler 16b. Uh, the, that's the name of the star, and it orbits two stars that are actually smaller than the sun. One's about 70 percent, and the other's about 20 percent the mass of the sun. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's not terribly far away. But that planet is more or less like Saturn, we think. And so it's probably a gas giant, not terribly habitable. I mean, aside from the unpleasantness of, you know, breathing methane and ammonia, which kind of stinky and, and make you choke. The double stars that orbits are, are, are quite dim, so it's probably not habitable. But I have to point out that Luke is not likely to be the only dude in the galaxy who requires double sunblock. Because as I said, half of all stars are binaries, and we have found planets around other binaries. And not only that, but some theoreticians have worked out that if you have two binaries, you know, two stars that are a team, that are buddies, in the old days we would say, forget that, there are not going to be any inhabitants, because if there are any planets around there, the, the changing gravitational tug will just throw them out, and they'll go, you know, they'll go away. But that turns out not to be the case. If they're separated by that, you can have planets here and here perfectly stable. Or if they're separated by that, so they sort of look like one star, then you can have planets in a big orbit around them, sort of like uh, the Tatooine in the movie. And indeed, astronomers in Denmark this week announced a discovery they made with the uh, radio telescope down in Chile, the Atacama uh, Millimeter Array, a double star system that is a, you know, a planetary system in the making. You can see the double stars there. I think Andy was going to give me a pointer, but that's okay. I'll just point. All right. So you, you see the two stars and the disks around each one. So those will probably produce planets around each one. And then there's this much bigger, <laughs> I hope it's infrared so I don't have to worry about missing. Okay, good. Push the button. Push the button. That's kind of hard. Okay. <laughs> the trouble with these things is you go wild, right? You know? All right. So here are the double stars. They go around you know, like this. And you're going to get planets there, planets there, but also planets here. Imagine what that'll look like to Luke. I think that'll be really impressive. Okay. Now, a few of the planets found in Star Wars are probably not so crazy either, although 
I have to say they look uncomfortable. Uh, one of them is this. In the Empire Strikes Back, there is a planetary system. It's an assemblage of six planets known as the Hoth, H-O-T-H, -H, as in what Hoth God wrought. The Hoth <laughs> system. The largest of these is covered in snowdrifts, but it's the home to this echo uh, base. I don't know, quite know what they do in that base. It looks like salt and pepper shakers there. But it looks like a, you know, a pretty terrible place to retire. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it's the funny thing about Hoff. Uh, it seems to happen a lot in this franchise despite X-wing fighters, interstellar travel, and hover calls, uh, cars. A lot of the transport seems to be by animal, either organic or mechanical, right? Now, I don't have to point out the obvious to you, but I don't see Detroit producing a lot of automobiles that look like horses or donkeys, right? <laughs> nor, <laughs> nor do I see commuters, you know, going into San Francisco every day on flea-bitten beasts, <laughs> although some of the commuter, commuters might qualify, I don't know. Also, what do they feed these guys, right? This plant's covered with ice. What's growing? I mean, what are, I don't know. All right. All right, now back to that snowdrift icy planet. Well, that isn't really so crazy because there are such places. This is Pluto. Some of you may recognize it. Uh, and, you know, it's maybe one of the Hoth planets right there. Uh, you might ask, is this habitable enough to build a base? And the answer is, well, maybe. I mean, there are other places covered with ice, like Europa here, a moon of Jupiter. And uh, that ice, you know, the, for scale, there's a dime in this photo. But if you can't see it, those, those icebergs are about a mile in in size, roughly. That's what you're looking at. Okay. But if you were to go down 10 miles underneath the ice, you would find twice as much water as you find here on Earth, liquid water. So uh, you know, the question is, is there anything alive down there? But there may be something to eat, right? So maybe you could have a base here. I mean, all right, that's kind of fun. Maybe it's even an interesting, appealing approach to learning a few astronomy facts. But of course, it's much more fun to consider things that really aren't logical, Captain. It's the wrong franchise. All right, like, <laughs> like these guys, the stormtroopers. Okay. Now, I've, I've never been clear uh, as to whose side these guys are on. But I, as far as I can tell, it really doesn't matter because their function in, in the films is very simple. They are metal ducks. The idea is that whenever they appear, you just shoot at them, right? And you kind of wonder with those uniforms, if that's what they are, they all do look pretty much the same. I mean, could they bend over to pick up a nickel on the sidewalk, right? Uh, and who dry cleans those things anyhow? I mean, they always look you know, perfectly clean, so I, I figure every night they have to put their uniforms into a system with you know, rotary wire brushes or something. You never see these guys laid back on a, on a chair on a pool deck or having a hamburger, although I'm told that there's at least one scene in the franchise where these guys actually take off their helmets and, and eat something. I don't know about going to the bathroom. I think you'd need a can opener for that. So, so you know, being a stormtrooper doesn't sound like the kind of career you would urge on your kids, right? Son, you can be a metal duck in space. But there's more serious weirdness in this franchise. Uh, here we have Princess Leia. Uh, <laughs> Princess Leia is pleading here to save the planet Alderaan. Okay, now Princess Leia, she has these... Cinnabon hairstyle here. And, and you know, I thought that that was pretty ingenious, but it turns out that the Hopi Indians had the same thing. <laughs> so, yeah, well, it, it, it has some benefits, I suppose, if you sleep on your side, because you don't need a pillow. All right. Anyhow, so she's, she's pleading because down on the planet Ald Alderaan, there are a lot of people, and they're going to get killed if you obliterate it. And that's the, the, the pleas to not use the Death Star to obliterate this planet. Um, all right, but even forgetting about the victims, it's, it's said that, you know, the, the, I, I think that Obi-Wan Kenobi felt that he could feel a disturbance in the force when that planet was obliterated. I don't know what that means. If you can find a disturbance in this force, if you have some piece of machinery that would allow you to find disturbances in the force, then you could take advantage of that disequilibrium and you could get energy out of the force and, you know, recharge your cell phone or something. But they don't explain any of that, of course. But one thing that I did wonder about is blowing up a planet. I mean, it's not clear to me why you would have to blow up an entire planet. If you want to get rid of the people, you don't have to blow up the entire planet. I mean, it does give the guys on the Death Star something to look at out the window, makes for a great YouTube video, and maybe Princess Leia has something to worry about for the weekend, but it, it seems like, if you will, overkill. Here they are, going to blow up the whole planet. All right, well, let's say you want to do it. 
you're, you want your Death Star <laughs> to blow up a planet. There's something else I was thinking about. Imagine writing home to mom. Guess what, mom? The military has assigned me to the Death Star, right? Just look at these shoulder patches. It's really neat. All right. So this Death Star is able to vaporize or at least blow to smithereens an entire planet. And by the way, the smithereens <laughs> will be playing at the Whiskey A Go Go on November 4th. That's in West Hollywood. According to uh, USA Today, they're Marshall Amped Post Mod Power Pop. I don't know what any of those adjectives mean, but those are the smithereens. They're on tour all the time. Okay, too many diversions. Now, I worked out the energy required to blow up a planet the size of Earth. And if I got the uh, integral right, it's about, as you see here, 2 times 10 to the 32 joules. Now, that, it may not be a unit you use every day, but that's a lot of energy, right? Uh, that's uh, 50 million trillion trillion calories, which is a unit you do use every day, right? Okay, but put another way, if you reckon it in terms of typical nuclear bombs, the amount of energy required to blow up that planet is 50 million billion bombs, okay? Now, here on Earth, we have about 17,000 nuclear bombs. I, I don't know who does the tally, but that's the, the number. Compare that to 50 million billion, right? You're worried about the 17,000, but this Death Star has to unleash the energy of 50 million billion bombs on, on a planet to, to, to blow it up a little bit, okay? Uh, and, and imagine being that crew member on board the Death Star, and your bunk is right next to the energy source, whatever it is. Uh, I mean, that's a lot of coal or wind power, AA batteries or something. But I, but I know what you're thinking. These guys are advanced. They don't use coal or wind power, AA batteries, to vaporize planets. They use something better. Well, of course, I, I hate to disappoint you, but I've actually thought of that. And the answer is, well, what's the best answer you could have? Matter, antimatter, annihilation, right? That's what they use in Star Trek, too. So, uh, you know, you convert matter into energy E equals mc squared, and that's, that's the best you can do if, you're <laughs> if your job description is to vaporize planets. Okay, so if you could convert one kilogram of mass into energy, that would give you 10 to the 17 joules. I mean, that would power your lifestyle for the next million years. That's a lot of energy, but doing this is much, much more. You know, compared to the energy cost of this little demonstration project for Princess Leah, that, that's Princess Leah, that's, that's really very little. So I just worked out how much mass you would need to convert into energy in order to do this. And it turns out to be mass equivalent to 1,000 Mount Everests, okay? So I don't know where they store that. I mean, there isn't gonna be enough overhead bin space to have mass of 1,000 Mount Everests on board the ship. Uh, I, I, I don't know. There you go. Yeah. Well, yeah, you might be able to fit them into a 100-mile diameter Death Star. I don't know. You, you wouldn't have room for anything else, but, you know, no, no fresh laundry or anything like that. So uh, I don't know where they'd get that fuel anyhow. But in, in any case, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense from any point of view. And frankly, it's much cheaper and less energy uh, intensive to give the inhabitants of Alderaan a few hundred episodes of reality television <laughs> and, and let their society implode naturally. I found this. This is the weather report for Alderaan. <laughs> it's pretty great. 72 degrees, 74 degrees, 15,000 degrees. No more degrees. All right. All right, moving on to more personal armament, lightsabers. Lightsabers. Okay, Obi-Wan Kenobi takes on Darth Vader in a lightsaber duel. Now, these lightsabers, you can look it all up, these lightsabers are... <laughs> Plasma blades, plasma. And they're powered by crystals, at least according to the instruction manual that came with mine. Crystals. Now, I don't know what it is, but a lot of people, friends of mine, have been mesmerized by the power of crystals, right? I mean, these are perfectly reasonable people, sort of. I mean, and I figured they somehow figure that crystals can somehow give them insights into relationships, happiness, career where to get a decent meal. It's all in crystals. All right, now, but think about it. Crystals are very regular. Here's where crystals might actually help you, actually. But crystals are very regular. They're as regular as the quality control guy for Miralax, right? They're, they're very regular. Some of you may have to think about that, but maybe the older people don't. I don't know. All right. All the atoms are spaced on lattices. And it seems to me pretty much impossible to get energy out of a crystal because, you know, they're about as stable as the Icelandic government, right? 
It's, it's imbalances that give you the opportunity to extract energy, chemical or nuclear imbalances. Uh, for example, certain isotopes of uranium, and in particular U-235, can produce lots of energy when they're split, but that's because U-235 is barely stable, right? It's like your cousin Louis, just barely hanging in there. Not like a crystal. Try and get a lot of energy out of, out of salt. I mean, it's a crystal or a rock candy. Anyhow, these lightsabers look pretty nifty, and apparently they can cut through just about anything except another lightsaber. But all the plasmas I know about are just, if you will, just hot gas, and I don't know how they can really, <laughs> I, I don't know why, what, what they're doing these things, and we just carve their, their initials on the walls. But, but the real question everyone should have about these lightsabers, and this is the one that you know, immediately appeals to me, is why fight with high-tech versions of medieval weapons? Right? They're fighting with swords. They have TIE fighters, they, they have all this stuff, and they get around on animals, and they fight with swords. Okay. This is very much, what is this doing? Come in here. Hold on. Kind of like Flash Gordon. Anybody remember Flash Gordon? <laughs> you the bad guys. Uh, they like to dress up like terracotta warriors, right? Swords, so these are very you know, simple weapons. Helmets that can also be used as colanders for washing broccoli. Uh, <laughs> So, I mean, you know, the Death Star may be overkill, but these lightsabers are underkill. All right, let's move on to another charismatic Star Wars appurtenance. Robots. Now, who could be other than sympathetic to appealing robots that have their own conversations, even though R2-D2 only whistles? Uh, now, it's hard to say that this technology is unrealistic. I mean, this may be the most important thing we do in the 21st century, which is to invent our successors, uh, invent generalized artificial intelligence, and then put it into some robots. Uh, and if you read the papers, you know that Silicon Valley billionaires uh, have recently become quite enamored of developing what's called generalized artificial intelligence. But I'd assume that given the uh, Star Wars ability to build X-wing fighters and fly off, to, fly off to other parts of the galaxy, they're GAI robots ought to be a lot more accomplished than the robots of Star Wars. I mean, R2-D2, C-3PO, they're underachievers. Although, although C-3PO claims to speak six million languages. I have to point out that my buddy in junior high school, Jerry, he claimed that too, but nobody could recognize more than one of them. So <laughs> I, I just figured these robots goofed off in school, except for, of course, the fact that they're born smart being robots. NASA said that it can already build robots that are more accomplished than these guys. And here's the question, why in this very futuristic society are there only two robots? Right? Why, hasn't, why haven't the robots taken over all the jobs, right? There's also the fact that R2-D2 seems to get around on wheels. Now, I can't be sure of that because they never show you the under, underside of his feet there. But looking at the way he kind of glides around the sets, so to speak, uh, I figure he's on wheels. Now think about it. How many animals can you name on Earth that use wheels for locomotion? And if the answer is one or more, you need help, right? <laughs> we wheels are tough to spin. <laughs> you know, they're tough to spin for biologi biological beings because the muscles kind of wrap up on the axles, right? And besides, and this is, of course, a greater consideration, they require prepared geography, which is to say roads or rails, something like that. Uh, so you can't count on finding these on a random planet. Wheels work great on the floor of a movie set, of course. Uh, think of the Daleks in Doctor Who. I always figured if you need to do escape the Daleks, why not just go upstairs? Uh, <laughs> also keep in mind that if any of you ever acquire a robot like R2-D2, you will have two problems. One. His constant whistling may annoy your dog. And two, you better not have any stairs in your home, as I just mentioned. Okay. It's also unclear what powers these robots, because you never see them eating anything or sidling up to a wall outlet, right? Okay, I, I really won't say too much more about the robots, because, to be frank, it's one of the few technologies in this series that you could say is modestly plausible, although... I had to say that in case of R2-D2, he clearly had ancestors that sucked. Okay. Here's... <laughs> Nobody said it was going to be good. The, 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 uh... 
the audience that wasn't attractive to begin with turned ugly quickly. All right. <laughs> but here's, well, here's, for love interest, is R2-D2's girlfriend or boyfriend, not quite clear. All right, now, the Wookiees. The Wookiees, on the other hand, are not so plausible. Right? They're taller than your average basketball player. They weigh on the order of 200 pounds. This is all according to the Wookiee handbook. And they're the only aliens I can think of that have fur. Uh, they apparently claim from the planet, the forest planet, Kashyyyk. There are three consecutive Ys in the spelling of that planet's name, so I'm not sure the uh, pronunciation. But of course, you know where they really come from, the Pacific Northwest, right? <laughs> <laughs> when they leave big footprints and they occasionally pose for 16 millimeter films and stuff like that. Um, only fleetingly photographed. So Chewbacca. Not really a good recommendation for the younger members of the movie going public, but think about this. Would you want a member of another species to be the co-pilot on your next flight, right? One who can't even hold up his side of the conversation. I mean, imagine going out the jetway at SFO and looking into the cockpit, and there's the captain, and next to him is this guy. <laughs> Personally, I'd turn around, or maybe call critter control, all right, the force. The force. I mean, when I first heard that, I figured it was a reference to those guys in the white plastic because, you know, those stormtroopers and their never iron body armor seem to me to be the force in terms of enforcing anything. But it's not. According to the wiki, Obi-Wan Kenobi pronounced this. The force is what gives a Jedi its, his power. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us, it penetrates us, it binds the galaxy together. Now, I thought that was dark matter, but of course, we still don't know what dark matter is, and so maybe it is the force, or maybe the force is it. I don't know, but controlling the force is obviously a good thing, because if you can control the force, you can, you can uh, sense all sorts of stuff. You can lift heavy objects. You can influence the minds of others, the Jedi mind trick that uh, Bill Diamond was talking about. You could see the future. I mean, if I could control the force, you know, I, I would go to Las Vegas. I mean, if I, if I could foresee the future, I'd go to Las Vegas and then call my stockbroker. But no one ever describes what the force really is in terms that a scientist could understand or even more important, run experiments on. So is the force all hogwash? You know, is it just pork or rinse or something like that? My inclination is to say, yes, it is. But of course, we do have forces in nature. We have four forces in nature, and we can do lots of things by mastering those forces. In particular, the electromagnetic force. Think of your cell phone. Don't turn it on, but think of it. It allows you to read the minds of others, or at least those who text you, and influence them in return. Electric motors allow you to lift heavy objects. So, you know, there's a force for you. Maybe not so spiritual, of course, but you wouldn't want too much spiritual influence in a force, I don't think. I'm, I'm glad that I don't need to mind meld with the electromagnetic force or pray to it in order to get my refrigerator to cycle at night, right? All right, so <laughs> what's the bigger picture regarding these adventures a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away? Well, even aside from the details of lightsabers, Wookiees, Death Stars, is the future portrayed in Star Wars even remotely possible? Or is it like The Hobbit, kind of a pleasant diversion, but so orthogonal to our existence as, you know, a world without advertising would be? Well, first consider the plausibility of galactic empires. Here's, here's a galaxy far, far away, but you know, all galaxies are far, far away compared to Stockton. Okay, so. Let me just give you a very simple scenario. The problem you have here is, of course, the speed of light. So suppose some Klingons mount an attack here. Now, you might say Klingons have just wandered in from the wrong franchise, but okay. So Klingons mount an attack here, and, you know, the, I don't know, the rebel forces, whatever, they see this, and they, they radio for help. They radio for help 10,000 light years away, which is, you know, a tenth of the way across this galaxy. Uh, they, they radio for help, hey, you know, <laughs> we're being attacked by Klingon sound help. So those guys, 10,000 light years away, fire up their interstellar battle wagon, and they come to take care of whatever's going on there. But of course, they can't go fast in the speed of light, but let's say they can go pretty fast, you know, close to the speed of light. So it takes another 10,000 years for them to get back here. Whatever the Klingons had in mind to do, they have done it. And in fact, everybody in that sector is now a Klingon, okay? 
So the point here is time scales. With these kinds of time scales, the speed of light kind of has as a corollary no galactic empires. Even the Roman Empire, if, if things were different, if the physics were different or the geography was different, and it took two years or 20 years, better yet, to get legionnaires up into Germany where there might be trouble, the Roman Empire wouldn't have existed. So, you know, I, I, I just don't think that these empires make sense. I mean, they're fun, but, but the really big uh, error to me is on Mose Isley. Here's Mose Isley. Kind of looks like Tunisia to me, but anyhow. All right, so Mose Isley. Now, there's a, there's a famous scene here, the Mose Isley canteen, where you see aliens, all of whom are <laughs> unattractive. Uh, you see all these aliens sort of sitting around having a brew and listening to music that, you know, probably wouldn't make it on your top 40, but there they are. Now, this doesn't make sense because it assumes that there are many different species nearby that have all reached the more, more or less the same societal level, that they can enjoy that music and have a brew and talk to one another and get in fights or whatever they do. Okay, that doesn't make any sense. Even if there have been a million societies that have cooked up intelligence in our galaxy, that means that even the two closest ones in time, right, are only, what, 10,000 years apart. That's the minimum kind of thing. Did I get that right? I may have gotten that right. Okay, so this, this just doesn't make any sense. But it was, fun. it was fun. All right, well, obviously it's pretty easy to be critical here. I think it's probably too easy to be critical here. A colleague of mine at the SETI Institute, Mr. Lee Lee, said to me yesterday, he said, Seth, you're going to get torn up tomorrow because you're complaining about things that the real Star Trek, uh, sorry, Star Wars <laughs> aficionados, <laughs> that's Freudian, Star Wars aficionados know was taken care of in the storylines. And if you'd only stayed awake during the films, you wouldn't be talking about this stuff. He may be right, but I would still like to advocate that there is some value to these films, right? Uh, other than to the film and toy industry, right? Star Wars, it's about space, it's about our future. It's so expansive that it must perforce extrapolate what we think our future may be, portraying it with increasingly sophisticated special effects. Some of it violates physics, none of that is ever gonna happen. Those aspects of Star Wars just aren't gonna come true, but all the rest is up for grabs. So I think that stimulating interest, particularly in young people, in science and in the adventure that science seems to offer them, is really the most valuable thing about Star Wars, unless you happen to be a stockholder in Disney, in which case it has other value. And speaking of films, as I uh, mentioned earlier, I occasionally consult for sci-fi flicks. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences, in their semi-infinite wisdom, about 10 years ago, realize that a lot of young people go into science because of some dumb movie they've seen, right? Uh, it's certainly true from most of my colleagues, and, and they, <laughs> they, they might object to the dumb part, but you know, they're, they're wrong about that. Okay, so, so what they figured was, this is an amazing leap of logic, they figured, look, if kids are getting interested in science because of the movies, why don't we make the movies more accurate? Now, you know, I, I have to say that, I, I, you know, that sounds like a good idea, and so is apple pie and motherhood, but I don't know that it really makes any difference, right? If you, if you take a kid to, to Star Wars, and, and one of the, the spacecraft goes by the camera, and you hear, whoosh, do you ever see the kid get up and say, that's it, Mom, I'm not going into science, I'm going to become a CPA, because in space, you would never hear that whoosh. <laughs> I, I don't think it matters. Honestly, I don't think it matters, but anyhow. All right, so... Because the Science and Entertainment Exchange, they, they set up an office down in uh, Irvine, I think, in Southern California. Whenever they hear about a film that's going to involve, you know, science, and in particular, you know, space and stuff like that, they're likely to call me up and say, look, do you want to consult with this guy? And somebody will call me up, you know, the producer, director, writer, will call up, or sometimes they'll fly me down to L.A., or they'll come up to Mountain View, whatever. Um, and, you know, it, it's always fun. In fact, here's, you know, Day the Earth stood still. I've already mentioned this. I actually got to get on the set here, I don't know if you can see that, but this is a scene in which the earthlings prove that they're worthy enough not to be incinerated by the aliens again. Uh, you can see the alien there on the left, Keanu Reeves. I remember when I went up to the set, all, all my colleagues at the SETI Institute said, Seth, we want you to find out, is Keanu Reeves really as dumb as we think he is? I didn't ask Keanu, but yeah. And there's Jennifer Connelly in the middle, and on the right is uh, John Cleese from, you know, Monty Python. He played the physicist. But the reason I show you this is that blackboard or green board in the back, and I know you can't see it, but if you could, and in the movie, of course, they're close-ups, 
Everything on that blackboard is in my handwriting because I wrote everything on that blackboard, right? <laughs> Including secret messages, which of course the editors didn't know. And you know, they just <laughs> and yeah, and yeah. So, you know, this is fun for me. But I will say that while I've consulted for I don't know half a dozen, maybe eight films, a most of them have been turkeys, right? Including this film. I, I hope nobody connected with the film was in the audience. But I don't think this film did as well as the first one in terms of, uh, you know, entertainment value. And I'm trying to figure out whether this, you know, could be attributed to my contribution. <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't think so. But, you know, maybe that's self-delusion. But when they do call up, usually there are three questions they always ask. So I will tell you these three questions. The first one is, why are the aliens here? Right? Because uh, in many sci-fi movies, the aliens actually come to Earth, it saves on sets, and beyond that, you know, it, it gives them the opportunity to, to trash our civilization, pretty much like tourists in Yosemite, I suppose. But this question is not relevant to Star Wars, because they don't come to the Earth and start to trash it. But the second question is, what weapons do they have? Right? You can see why the, the writers and directors, and, and you know, the art director in particular, would want to know what weapons do they have. As if I know, right? Well, I'll tell you what they had last week, but, you know. Not. <laughs> but I, I think it's a dumb question, because if they can come here, or if we go there, or if it's Star Wars, or, you know, intergalactic battles or whatever, uh, they're way ahead of us. So to ask what weapons they have would be like asking Julius Caesar, hey, Julius, uh, what sort of weapons do you think the military will have in the year 2016? Right? And Julius would say, well, I don't really know, but of course he would speak Latin, but uh, I, I don't really know, but you know, they probably have bigger shields and long, long spears and stuff like that. Everything he'd say would be wrong, right? Uh, so, you know, I figure everything I say would be wrong, but there are a few thoughts I offer to you. Most of our weaponry still involves, after, you know, half a millennium, maybe more, hurling hunks of heavy metal at the enemy. Now, there's, it's really pretty kind of primitive. There's a real probability that no matter how good your aim, you might miss, because the hurling is actually not that much faster than the enemy moves, for example. Uh, a rifle bullet. A rifle bullet might move, I don't know, 1,000 feet a second, roughly the speed of sound. Some are a little faster. But an enemy soldier might be able to scamper around at 10 feet a second. Okay? So that means you take good aim, you fire, and if the enemy is, say, 60 yards away, right, uh, it takes enough time that by the time the bullet gets there, the guy has moved two feet. So there's a chance you'll just miss, right? Okay, it, the bullet could easily zing past him and you just, you know, wasted your shot. Now, consider the weaponry of Star Wars. They're using laser beams, at least I think. It's, it's hard to be sure because in this case, you notice this laser beam kind of bends. I don't know, maybe there's... You know, hot, heavy concentration of air there or something. Anyhow, all right. But they're using these laser beams, and of course those move at the speed of light. Now, I don't know how fast these TIE fighters and, you know, X-wing goodie boppers uh, move, but if you look at the speed at which they're going by the landscape, you would estimate, well, they're going to maybe a couple of thousand miles an hour. All right. So it's a really simple calculation. In the time it takes for the laser beam to come off the wingtip there and get to that other craft, that's a microsecond. How far has that other craft moved if it's going a few thousand miles an hour? A millimeter. All right. So, you know, every, every shot will hit. <laughs> you, you, you fought, you'll, you'll hit them every time. Unless, of course, you're being stupid about it, like they do in Star Wars, and have humans doing the aiming. <laughs> all, the, all the aiming will be done by, you know, computers fundamentally. Same with the flying, by the way. I mean, <laughs> these guys are, you know, they're flying. I mean, they're only in those, those devices, whatever they are, those craft, to have witty banter with one another and, and maybe get killed. There's no other function they could reasonably serve. This is from the Guardian newspaper. As part of an expanding program of battlefield automation, the U.S. Air Force has said it is now training more drone operators than fighter and bomber pilots and signaled that the end of the era of the fighter pilot is in sight. So the dogfights in Star Wars, here they missed all. The dogfights in Star Wars are about as realistic as fighting with those high-tech swords. The third and final question that always gets asked by the Hollywood types is this, what will the aliens look like? <laughs> 
It's again, you know, it's like asking trilobites. So, okay, trilobites, uh, you know, 400 million years from now, what's the top dog on this planet gonna look like? Well, probably like a trilobite, actually. And, and, <laughs> hey, we don't know what they're gonna look like. But I, but I remind you that we've actually been looking for the cast of Star Wars using the Allen Telescope array here. And of course, we won't know what they look like if we pick up a signal, but we'll at least know they're there. And if we know they're there, maybe we can look more intensely and maybe they'll send us pictures, who knows. But in any case, we're, you know, there's real science here. I have to tell you the obvious thing. But in the case of the movies, the aliens, <laughs> there are only a couple of categories. One is your ISO standard alien. <laughs> and this is very popular with, with, uh, with Hollywood because it doesn't require any backstory, right? And you already know that's an alien. Uh, another possibility is one of these guys, you know, just aching to be turned into a rug. But the real answer, and this is my favorite plot of all my talks, is this. This is Hans Morovich, the roboticist. Well, that's good. Uh, the roboticist at Carnegie Mellon's plot, in which he plots the amount of compute power you can buy for $1,000 as a function of time. And uh, I, I won't dwell on this plot, but the bottom line is this. By the year 2020, your laptop will have the same compute power as a human brain. Okay. And uh, you know, an undergraduate at the University of Washington, when I, when I said this in a talk once, he said, yeah, but when that happens, when we have machines that can think, won't they kill us all? <laughs> that was natural optimism of youth, but <laughs> what, <laughs> what I said to him is, you know, I've I got some goldfish at home. I'm, I'm probably smarter than they are, but I don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to kill them. Okay. So anyhow, so, but, but the point of this graph is to tell you, again, something that I just love to say and nobody likes to hear, that the big thing that we're going to do in this century is invent our successors, right? And so you can assume that the aliens, if they're advanced, have done the same thing. So what that means is, and here's Ray Kurzweil's take on it. Ray Kurzweil is also planning to live forever, but so maybe you don't believe everything. But what he's saying here is that, you know, all right, by 2029, 2045, whatever, we're going to have intelligence that dwarfs human intelligence. He may be wrong by a century. He might be wrong by two centuries. None of that matters. Those are all very short time scales compared to the history of humanity, right? So he's right in a sense. And, and by the way, some of those machines aren't going to stick around. They're going to get up and leave. I, as pointed out by this artificial intelligence expert, Louis Del Monte, machines will view us as an unpredictable and dangerous species. <laughs> That could be. I, I had the feeling that my cell phone already feels that way. So some of them are going to, some of them are going to get up and leave. They're just going to leave, and they can do that. Maybe some will stick around if you feed them. I don't know. But the bottom line here, and really my last point, is that if we ever come across other inhabitants in the galaxy, they're not going to look like Luke Skywalker. They're not even going to look like these guys, as attractive as they are. They're going to be this guy. They're going to be this guy. All right, well, I want to thank you so much for listening. Uh, I want to suggest that uh, you may need the force to get out of the parking lot. Thanks for coming. We'll take a few questions. Andrew Fracknoy mentioned a, a certain uh, the election for certain national office coming on November 8th. Could we write you in? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it, Mark. I, see, I know that guy. And, you know, I hope you use the $5 well. Okay. <laughs> uh, somebody over here? I, I can't see where there's... Me? Y yes, you. Okay. Um, I was wondering... Um, you said that the three questions that you get asked most are not necessarily the like most efficient questions. What what kind of what can you give me an example of like a question that you think the um, like Hollywood producers actually should ask? Yeah, that's that's actually a very good question, and I wouldn't want to second guess them. I have to tell you that the majority of questions, those three, the ones I told you are recurrent questions. So they all ask those same three questions at some point. But usually when they call up, it's because they want you to solve a problem for them. Right? I was just called by a, a director down at uh, Bad Robot Productions in Santa Monica. And he said, look, here's the problem. These guys are in the space station. And when they wake up one morning, and they look out the window, and the Earth is gone. 
So what we need is some explanation for that. So, <laughs> could be the Death Star. Yeah, well, so usually they want you to solve some sort of technical problem. What they almost never want is for you to suggest some ideas, big ideas that have come up in astronomy uh, in the past, if you will, 100 years that they could use in the stories. The stories are all, if you will, repetitions of earlier stories. And the, the, the reason is that the writers are, you know, they're not schooled in science particularly. They're good writers, as they should be, by the way. I mean, it's not our job. I have to say, science fiction films are not STEM education, okay? <laughs> but it would, <laughs> if you haven't noticed, but, it, but I think it would be actually uh, refreshing if they would ask, you know, well, what sort of new things have happened in astronomy in the past 10 or 20 years that would be interesting? Because you could suggest some things that might make for big themes. Uh, for example, uh, I don't know, I mean, all the planets that we've been finding, that, that's something they're only vaguely aware of. They don't know the variety of planets and stuff like that. Maybe you could do something there, but I think more than that, would any society ever expand into space? Would they continue to build big things? Would they build really big things like, you know, astro engineering projects? mega structures in space. Would they do that? I mean, our own society is making things smaller and smaller all the time, right? So, you know, those kind of questions they never get to somehow, somehow. And uh, the answer to your question about the Earth being gone, well, what if just the spacecraft turned around? <laughs> Good answer. Okay, over here. So you, you, you've obviously given uh, at least a little thought to the subject of uh, science fiction in the, the movies. So I'd be interested in your uh, top three picks for movies that you think actually reasonably did get the science right. And uh, also, you know, one or two of your favorites regardless of how bad the science is. <laughs> Well, I got to tell you, you know, getting the science right has never been a criterion for me. And the ones I like best are often the ones that are really cheesy because they make me feel better, I think. I mean, the original War of the Worlds, which I saw as a kid, of course, but I, you know, in fact, my whole interest in astronomy probably derives from a film that none of you will have seen, but called Destination Moon. I think it was 1951. Anybody see it? <laughs> All right. Now you know the demographics. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, you know, obviously movies are important, but the ones you see as a kid have a, have a power that you, you never get back. But in terms of accuracy, so more of the worlds, for example, and also Forbidden Planet, because there were some visuals in there. You know, we saw the, the, the engineering projects of the Krells, I guess they were, right? Th those were really good. And Walter Pigeon. Was it Walter Pigeon? I think it was Walter Pigeon. Yeah, who was the female lead? Thank you, Anne Francis. Anne Francis. All right, uh, but in terms of accuracy, most of them are not, uh, not accurate at all, but contact was fairly accurate. At least the beginning was very accurate when they portrayed SETI and so forth. We were, we were all uh, consultants. The SETI Institute scientists were consultants on the film. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I remember well, the, the, the casting director came up from Santa Barbara. Do you care about these anecdotes? Came up from Santa Barbara, and she, and she sat down in my office. She said, all right, Seth, I want to see these scientists. I said, there they are. <laughs> and so she walked out the door, and she disappeared for about an hour or two, and then she came back. And I said, well, did you learn anything? And she said, two things. First, you all have fancy coffee mugs. <laughs> and if you look at the movie carefully, you'll see that all the techno guys all have fancy coffee mugs. And the second thing she said is, I noticed the way you guys carry your weight around here. And I thought, wow, she somehow sensed the you know, the hierarchy or something in the institute. No, that's not what she meant. She said, you guys all have sedentary jobs. You're all, you all pretty big around the middle. <laughs> and again, in the movie, the technical guys are all pretty big around the middle. Okay, I can tell you more stories about that. But that was actually fairly accurate. I mean, aside from the, you know, the, the, the Coney Island machine that she uses to go to another star system. They, the yard department did call me up one day and they said, Seth, what does it look like to go through a wormhole? <laughs> I said, well, I can tell you what it was like two weeks ago when I did it last, but, and, and what, I, what I said was, well, it turns out that, you know, if you're going close to the speed of light, the whole universe collapses into a bright dot in front of you and a bright dot behind you. You could do that. In most movies that just uh, computer animate something that looks like you're flying through a pig's intestine. 
right? I said, but you know, those bright dots is what it would look like. Of course, it's not visually very interesting. And they said, okay, thank you, click. <laughs> and if you see the movie, it's a pig's intestine, right? <laughs> okay, enough of that, I guess. Yes? Uh, it seems like every, <clears throat> every science fiction movie I've ever seen with space aliens, they almost always have two eyes, two ears, you know, two, you know they, they seem roughly humanoid-like. Uh, as a practical matter, is there any reason to think that life would, intelligent life would tend to evolve symmetrically with two eyes, opposing thumb and forefingers, you would assume? Are there any basic things you kind of think it would be reasonable to expect intelligent life to possess uh, appearance-wise? Yeah, another good question, and one that's uh, the subject of some debate, actually. Um, and you might say, look, you know, we're the result of chance, circumstance, you know, whatever. And there's no reason we would have to look the way we are. But there are some engineering considerations. There's at least one evolutionary biologist at uh, Cambridge, actually, uh, Simon Conway Morris. You might want to look him up. And he thinks they would look very much like us. But he has other reasons for thinking that. But the, 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 the facts are that there are some advantages. I mean, there's something called convergent evolution, right? Why do all the predators in the ocean look like torpedoes? Right, because he can go faster. I mean, it's you know they're not necessarily related to one another, but evolution has driven them to that sort of body form. But in, in, for for us, I mean, having a head is actually a good idea because you can get the sensors and the compute power close to one another. And remember, we don't have electrical circuitry in the usual sense. It's you know electrochemical circuitry, so it's very very slow. So it's good to have your eyeballs near to your brain and that sort of thing. If your eyebrows were down, if your eyeballs were down in your kneecaps, for example. You, you know, you might not be able to see over the grass, and, grass and, and, and catch dinner. I mean, there are some advantages to all these. Having one eye is great. Eyes have been invented, if you will, by evolution, uh, something like eight or ten times, depends on whom you ask, by nature. Because, you know, a planet that's bathed with light from a nearby star, there's a big advantage in being able to see. And even some bacteria have some very primitive light sensing, right? So, but having one eyeball is great, but having two eyeballs is better if you're a predator you know, forward facing, because now you get 3D vision, right? So all these sorts of things, you could go down the list and say, well, what about this, what about this? Having that opposable thumb, maybe you could argue that the trouble with the dolphins, who are claimed to be very clever, I, I know people who study dolphins, and they're always telling me how clever the dolphins are, but if I go down to the Sunnyvale Library and look under dolphin literature, you know, it's a really restricted section. Uh, they don't... <laughs> so how clever are they? And I think the problem is they can't pair up, uh, pick up a pair of pliers. So I think that uh, having those opposable thumbs is something you could also argue. If they don't have that, you're probably not going to see them in a Star Wars film because they're not doing anything very technological. These are very, in some sense, these are obvious and simultaneously weak arguments. And, and so I, you know, I argue against lack of imagination, if, if I can argue that. Yes, sir. Uh, do you think the oh, force could be compared to string theory? Could the force be compared to string theory in that they're both fictional, you mean? <laughs> No. Oh, oh that the five physicists in the front row just objected. <laughs> I don't know this string theory. I don't know enough about string theory. I've heard, you know, reputable physicists, one at Columbia uh, University actually, who, who thinks that it's just, you know, it's just nonsense. But the, the real problem with string theory is that it's hard to come up with a prediction that you can test. So that's the problem with string theory. I think string theory actually has a good chance of being right, the little I know about it. Uh, and, and it would be great because it, it gets to some very fundamental physics. But to say that the force is like string theory, the force, these guys can sense the force, right? I don't know that you can sense those little vibrating strings, right? So I, I'm not sure it's the same. I, I don't know what the force is. To me, it's just mumbo jumbo, but, you know. <laughs> but I, I don't know. I don't know what the force is. If you know what the force is, if, <laughs> let me know. Get a patent on it. All right, do we have any, yes? Uh, good evening, sir, sister. My name is Simona, and I would like to uh, ask you questions. I would like to know, what is your opinion, why the extraterrestrial might be interested for the contact, contact to human society? What is special about the human beings? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, why are they interested in contacting us? Well, maybe they're not, because as far as we know, they haven't made any contact, right? So, and, and this, is, this is something that's brought up, actually, in, in emails and conversation that I deal with essentially every week, where people say, they're never going to get in touch with us. You guys are using those antennas to look for signals. They're never going to aim any signals our way because we're too primitive or we're just badly behaved or whatever. We're like ants, 
to these guys, right? But you know what? That's alien sociology. And the data set for alien sociology is, is sparse, as <laughs> pointed out to me by a guy by the name of Chris Scheiber many years ago. So we don't, we don't really know <laughs> what would find, they would find interesting. And maybe, indeed, we are like ants to them. I mean, who knows? I, I don't think they even know about us, but if they did, that we might be just like ants. But you know, think, you know, tell that to E.O. Wilson at Harvard. He spent his entire career studying ants, right? So the, the, the fact that you don't think that we're very interesting, um, maybe you're right, but I, I don't know that you can prove that. I think the fact that we haven't heard from them has nothing to do with our behavior or anything like that. It has to do with the, the magnitude of the search that we've mounted, which has been, unfortunately, mostly due to uh, considerations of funding, has still been too limited. Hi, thanks. This is great fun. I appreciate it. Um, one of the one of the films that made a huge impact on my own life uh, that I saw as a kid was 2001: A Space Odyssey, and I was sort of surprised you didn't bring it up. But I mean, he, they, Arthur C. Clarke, tried to do something close to what was likely to happen by 2001. And so, you know, when I was a kid, I thought, oh my God, this is so great, I can hardly wait, this is gonna be fantastic. But we print pre pre predicting, you know, artificial intelligence and a whole bunch of stuff in that movie. You know, since then, why have we missed by such a big gap, you know, in terms of our narrow human lifetimes, if all these scientists and engineers were so smart about the speed of technological progress, and yet we didn't come close? Yeah, well, I think that's a perennial lament. Uh, you know, it's like saying, why don't we have those flying cars yet? They were predicted in the 1950s for sure, right? And my, my uh, freshman advisor, a physicist, actually wrote a book called The High Frontier. Jerry O'Neill was his name. And he was predicting that by the 1990s, tens of millions of people would be living in rotating aluminum cans in orbit around the Earth. And he worked out, you know, a very clever guy, he worked out all the you know, the engineering, he had his grad students do it, uh, worked out all the engineering considerations for building these things. You know, tubes that might be 10 miles long and a mile in diameter, and, you know, you slowly spin them, and on the inside you get essentially one G's worth of gravity and all that. He worked out the food problem, all that stuff. And it, it isn't that you couldn't build them. Could have built them in the 1990s even. But it's still cheaper to build condos in Arizona. So that's what happened there. All right. Uh, I think a lot of these other things, you, you, I think it's maybe a selection effect. You're sensitive to the things that, pre that were, were predicted that didn't happen, and you're not quite so sensitive to the things that happened that nobody even predicted, like you know the ubiquity of cell phones or that cell phones would come to replace a lot of other devices, that sort of thing. Nobody was really predicting that. So I, I think it's a mixed bag. There are just some things that are dominated by considerations of economics or maybe fundamental technologies, like you know the space elevator. That'll happen someday, but we, we need you know, very high tensile strength materials and so forth. You, you know, it's just the time is not right. Two more and then I have. Okay, two more questions, and then Andy has a question. Is there somebody over here? Yes, there is. Okay. Why did scientists make sci make aliens if they didn't even know what they were, and if they even existed? Yeah. Well, why? Yeah, that's right. Well, you know, aliens were mostly invented not so much by the scientists as by writers fiction writers. You might ask Andy Fracknoy here about that because he writes science fiction. But, you know, it's, aliens are great bad guys for movies because after the Soviet Union collapsed, you know, who is going to be a bad guy, right? It's, it's hard to pick on some other nationality because, you know, they get upset and they're maybe not that bad, right? Whereas aliens, they can be just as bad as they want to be. And they don't ask for residuals. I mean, there are a lot of advantages for casting aliens as bad guys in films. Now, occasionally they're good guys, like an E.T. You probably may have seen E.T. He's a good guy. He's just a little guy from the Andromeda galaxy. He comes two million light years to pick some plants and play with the kids. Okay. And he's a good guy. But that's exceptional. Mostly they're bad guys. And it's just because of the necessities of a storyline. And a storyline, if you don't have any bad guys, you know, you just put the book down or you walk out of the movie. So I think that's all there is to it. Yes. Two questions, one yes or no. Do you think The Martian was probably the best technically correct film we, that's come lately? And secondly, what propulsion systems are gonna take us beyond the solar system that you know about today? Well, I mean, I don't know if I can tell you that, the answer to that latter question, unless you really can demonstrate you have a need to know. Um, <laughs> Yeah, The Martian was very accurate. Uh, you know, Andy Weir, who wrote The Martian, 
He lives like, you know, he's in Mountain View, near Middlefield, right? He's not very far away. And he would occasionally call up people at NASA Ames to, to check on the science. I think that the only really, if you will, serious science problem there, I mean, the, the guys over at Ames, <laughs> Dave Morrison can probably verify this if he hasn't left, but, uh, you know, they say it would actually be hard to grow potatoes in that soil uh, on Mars and this, that, and the other. But I think that the only really serious error, and Andy Weir was well aware of this, was the fact that the pressure of any wind is obviously proportional to the speed squared of the wind, but linearly proportional to the density of the air. Now, on Mars, you have faster winds, so that sounds like much more pressure. Maybe it'll knock down a habitat. But the air is only 1% as dense as it is in this room. So you multiply those two numbers together, and you would find that even a <laughs> hurricane force wind on Mars would barely flap a flag, let alone knock down a habitat. So I think that uh, among the you know, things that you say that's a little dicey, there are many things, but I, I think that may be the only really serious thing. All right. So I'd like the privilege of asking the last question. Uh, you've been wonderfully humorous with, with your descriptions of science fiction, but we also know that you're very involved with the actual search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which is a very exciting project to many of us. Say a little bit, if you would, about the real future. What do you see as the future of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence? What would you like to see happen in the next few years, in the next decades, to make that more of a reality? Well, indeed. Uh, I showed you a photo. Maybe I still have it here. Of the Allen Telescope Array. This is located about 300 miles north of where you're sitting, uh, up in the Cascade Mountains. And we use this every day, actually, trying to eavesdrop on radio signals. Right? We haven't found anything. Uh, why not? What would it take to find something? You know, is this something that's going to take thousands of years? There are people who think that it might. Uh, but I don't think so. If you look at the history of this kind of an effort, and it's very similar to what Jodie Foster was doing in the movie Contact, of course, uh, the, the history of this effort is that because it hasn't been funded very adequately for a long, long time, uh, it's, you know, the, the, the manpower available, the money available to buy the equipment, to expand this thing. I mean, you could expand this thing by a factor of 10, right, and still have something that would be very, I mean, it would be extraordinarily useful, much more sensitive. You could expand this with a lot less money by just building new, what are called backends, processors to look at the incoming cosmic noise and sift it out and look for signals. That's just something that we, we know how to do, but there's no money to do it. So a lot of it is just, you know, this sounds like a plea for money, but <laughs> in some sense it is, but the facts are that indeed a lot of it is simply constrained by money. And I, you know, people have this idea that SETI is a project because it's so important. There must be a lot of people working on it. But I can tell you that the total number of people in the world that do this for a living is about the same number of people in one row of this auditorium. Okay. And, and not wall to wall, just middle section. So it's a very limited uh, system. So in a, in a sense, we know how to improve this kind of an experiment. There, but there are other experiments you could do. You could look for flashing laser pulses, for example, light signals, like the cowboys used to use in the movies with their shaving mirrors, right? That actually makes sense. You can work out the numbers. The biggest lasers we have over in Livermore, for example, if you aim those lasers into a mirror this big, it would be highly visible even 100 light years away, okay? So we're actually developing some equipment to try and improve that kind of a search as well. So that's something else you do. And the other thing you could do is you could actually look for artifacts. Somebody mentioned 2001, and you remember in 2001, they, they go to the moon and they dig up something, who knows what they're looking for, bauxite, I don't know. All right. and, and, and they find this buried monolith, kind of uninteresting. How many bits of information do you get from a monolith? One, they built a monolith. Right? It's not, you, know, you think they'd fill it with CDs or, or something, but in any case, but you can imagine, it's not impossible, that somebody may have come to this solar system 100 million or, or, or 3 billion years ago, and they looked around and they said, well, there's nothing but by bacteria or dinosaurs or something like that here, but who knows, maybe something interesting will ultimately develop here. And, you know, maybe what we'll do is we'll just leave a, a time capsule or a greeting card or, or a map to where they can find us if they ever get to that point. And you wouldn't want to leave that on the Earth because the Earth has weather, not in California, but in most parts, it has weather and it has tectonic activity, which kind of chews everything up. So by putting it on the moon, which, you know, the weather is considerably, <laughs> it's, 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 it's always the same, right? 
you put it on the, on the moon or there are other places in the solar system where you could put these sorts of things. That, that idea in 2001, that actually made sense. So you could, in fact, mount a project to look for artifacts in our own solar system. I mean, you know, there, there's no money for that either, but that's, that's not nutty. I don't think it's totally nutty. All right, Andy, thank you. Thank you, Seth. Before people leave, I'm supposed to read the names of the winners of those who get us t-shirt from having entered in the front. So let me do that. Tom Hofstedt, uh, Tom Prieto, Olivia Wildanger, Mia Ballou, and Lorraine Slater. If you're here, claim your t-shirt outside. Everyone else, thank you so much for coming and participating. We hope to see you November 2nd. Drive carefully. <laughs>